Hey everybody, welcome to Drive to Win. I'm Justin Bell, and of course, this podcast brought to you by the Win Las Vegas and Mobile One for the love of driving. Well, my guest this week, who will be joining us in a few minutes, is the one and only NASCAR legend, Dale Earnhardt Jr. You might think, why am I having a NASCAR legend on the show? Well, it's pretty obvious. He loves racing, he loves cars, and he's one of the most influential figures in American motorsports. So I'm actually kind of a little starstruck. I'm looking forward to, to chatting with him in a bit. But what about that Japanese Grand Prix then? I hope you all stayed up late if you're on the west coast of the States to, to watch and got up early if you're in the UK. And it really was one of those races I was excited for. And you could see it in all the social media, from whether it was the drivers, whether it was like Damon Hill, David Coulthard, any of the, the ex-Formula One drivers who with X Formula One champions, they were all talking about how much they were looking forward to the Grand Prix in Japan. And I'll tell you, I've raced there. I raced there in Japanese touring car, JTCC. And there is something special about the Japanese fans. They're kind of rabid with their excitement. It's a, a combination of the track, which is, I mean, Suzuka is just so demanding, so fast. It has that, you know, over and under, which is, you know, a bit like a, one of those fun sort of karting tracks. But at high speed, I mean, the open full throttle time is almost unparalleled. But it's the fans, it's the food, and all wrapped together is a kind of Formula One frenzy. And I remember when I went there to drive, I mean, I was at the midfield. No one had ever heard of me. And I get there and there's all these fans with like Justin Bell t-shirts and, and little signs and pictures of me. And I'm like, how the heck do you know I was even turning up? And that is what the Japanese fans do. I'm sure that even Logan Sargent had a ton of people waiting for him there. And that's what they do. They kind of get behind even the people at the back of the grid. Thank goodness for those of us that were at the back of the grid. Uh, of course, going into it, there was this feeling that after the DNF, after the did not finish for Max Verstappen in Australia, and then, of course, the win, you know, with the appendixless Carlos Sainz, I, I knew that Max coming into the Japanese Grand Prix was just going to come in with the afterburner on, and that is, in many respects, what, what he did. And seeing qualifying, they set the scene for the whole race with the qualifying, right up the front, two Red Bulls, Max and then Sergio Perez. And it really was that front row lockout. Uh, but the gap was so small. And I think that's the story of the weekend. The margin in many ways, when it comes to overall pace, was much tighter than we've seen. And that, my friends, I think is the hope for the future for everyone else. And of course, uh, you know, it was really going into the race. We knew there'd be a lot of dynamics. Suzuka traditionally can have a lot of rain and that and we've all seen those shots. Uh, and I thought the broadcast team did a brilliant job of showing some historic shots of, of Suzuka in the rain. And it, it's mind-blowing, mind-numbing how the grip those cars have. Thankfully, when it came to the race, it was pretty glorious sunshine. But it was a lot warmer. We'll get to that in a, in a minute. So I'm sitting there watching the start, like you all are, just ready for it to get off the line. And I'm thinking, once again, uh, you know, well, actually probably less than normal with my anticipation. If Ferrari's next to Max, I think, well, maybe they'll outrun him to the, outgun him to the first corner. I knew that Sergio was never going to do that. But, you know, a nice clean start it looked look like. And then, I mean, a crash on, on the first, you know, just literally going to turn three when uh, Alex Albon and, and Daniel Ricciardo came together. And there's much dispute on what happened there. But just, it almost might... Brian, who who is you know my one of my technical guys in the studio right behind us, he just said to me he just joined the show and he thought it was well in the race when he saw that. No, they'd gone about sixteen seconds into the race, and I knew that this was going to set off a, a real catalyst, a kaleidoscope of of aftershocks, which we did see happen in the race. And one of those things is it immediately resets the strategy across the board for every single team. And I just have this vision of of all these people, not just at the racetrack, because they have such technical support at home in their factories, that all these super bright men and women suddenly diving into their laptops to try and work out how they can now alter the strategy to the end of the race. So, uh, but what caused it? Well, it is very high speed. It 
the tyres are not up to working temperature, and there's that bottleneck that always happens there. And in racing, I mean, it's funny when you're looking from above, I find myself doing it, and I'm sure all pro drive, ex-pro drivers do, you're looking at it on TV and you see the whole picture, so it's a little bit more daunting. When you're in the car, all you're seeing is literally the people around you, so you can only respond to that. You can't see too far too far to the side or too far behind. And I'm glad that the officials decided no, no further action to be taken. Both cars were out, so what further action? Um, but really, and um, we'll touch on it a bit later, but it caused this mess and stress for Williams, and you could see James Fowles probably just... I mean, he is a very calm guy with a wonderful, uh, placid sort of demeanor, but I'm sure even he managed a, a WTF at that point. Um, my my feelings about the start really uh, were that my anticipation was that Max, especially on the second start, was that Max, if he, if he can, you know, with Red Bull controlling the front of the grid, he was just basically going to clear off into the trees and, and, you know, lead by a margin. But out of DRS range, but it was really interesting to note that at the end of the first lap, he was only like 0.8 of a second ahead. He wasn't clearing the DRS zone as he went into lap two. And it yes, the net effect was the same, but the way they got there was interestingly slow, uh, slow, just not as dominating uh, over the course. So I, I really thought that was interesting. Let's run through the top 10. And Max, obviously... It was his third successive win at Suzuka. He con- converted pole position for the 30th time in his res- in his career. And it was his third victory in four Grand Prix this season, which makes it 20 out of 22 races. 20 out of the last 22 races. Just take that in. It's outstanding. And what I really do like about Max is, whereas some drivers might be, I don't know, you might think, oh, they, they could soften a little or they might not execute and compromise just as hard, you know, even when they have an advantage. There is no such thought as that to Max. That's why he's the world champion and will be probably another five times. He has, there's no sympathetic side to his driving. It is just a hammer. And now the gap is definitely close on overall pace. Uh, on overall pace. It, I think the magic still is there that they don't put a foot wrong, do they? they he never puts a wheel wrong. The pit stops everything, the strategy, the way they manage the tires. And yes, he only won by 12 seconds, but I've said it before. I think that given the the free reign and if he got more money for every second he had extended a lead, I think he would just, yeah, I mean, he'd win by 60 seconds. And he always seems to have so much more in hand. And that's why on with one lap to go, he goes and pops in the fastest lap. I think it's just for his own amusement. He, obviously, there's a benefit to that. I'm sure he has a bonus on that. But it just it just shows he has all that. While the others are, you know, right on the edge, he just has the ability to to you know push it when he needs to. And and it's his lap by lap pace is unmatched. Um, I wonder because you know you see a side of him in social media and you in some funny interactions with drivers. And he obviously has a good sense of humor in his own way. I wonder what he says to his girlfriend when he gets back in the motorhome or whatever. Like, that wasn't a tough race for him. Driving a Formula One car at that speed is obviously very tough, but it wasn't a tough race for him. And so I wonder if he actually admits that uh, to anyone, maybe his dad, I don't know. But of course, another statistic that is remarkable is he's the only, he just became the fourth driver in history to have led 3,000 laps of a Grand Prix or more. And that is Michael Schumacher, Sebastian Vettel, Lewis Hamilton, and now uh, Max Verstappen. That's pretty cool, right? Sergio Perez. Well, I don't have to mince my words today about how he did. He did really well. And his pace was blinding, actually. Uh, For me, one of his best race weekends, pretty much doing the job he's supposed to do, which is be strong in every session. I mean, he qualified only a hair behind Max. His race craft was strong. We saw him pulling some really dynamic moves. I know he likes the track. Um, and he really deserves credit, uh, especially Christian Horner at the end said, what a great race. You you really work hard for that, uh, Sergio. And he did. And remember, his job is up for review. Everyone in the paddock knows it. And everybody in the paddock wants it. 
uh, especially maybe the man who finished right behind him. But if second is the best he's asked to do, when he is second, then he's done his job, right? He's fulfilled his mission, mission accomplished. And I don't think anyone can criticize him in any way for what he did this weekend. But then, of course, behind you have Carlos Sainz and Carlos Sainz, uh, show me the money, Carlos. I mean, didn't he look so strong? I mean, outclassed his teammate on the tires once again. Uh, it's his third podium of the season. Ferrari, for sure, have now established themselves as the second best team on the track right now. The, you know, it, they really are in that position. That seems something that you hear a lot about, whether it's in Drive to Survive or even in the commentators talking about where they line up in the 10 teams, and they're definitely second. And such an improvement uh, on everything they did last year, whether it's the way they re react to all sorts of tracks, the strategies, the way their tire management. And I mean, I'm going to say this because he is a pro, so this that doesn't really happen, but there's weird inflections in the way and weird things that happen to drivers or all athletes. It's funny. It's like he's raised his game since he got released from Ferrari. Now, that doesn't make any sense at all, but it really shows that he is pushing in every way, in every aspect. And I've always said, haven't I, that he was, he, he's the stronger man, I think, mentally. And where does he go in 25 and beyond? He's got to be the hottest property in the grid. Uh, he says he's talking to everybody with his management, as they should be. And I'm sure everyone's talking to him. But one cautionary note I'm sure they're aware of, he's riding, the, you know, he's on the surfboard in the big wave right now. Everyone's staring at him and it looks like it goes on forever. But Formula One tends to level out, as we saw like Fernando Alonso last year with Aston Martin. And when they level out, your stock can drop a little. What if one of the other teams like Mercedes or McLaren start to beat you regularly? Suddenly your stock isn't quite as high. So I'm sure he's going to want to lock in a deal before too long. Which is for the, the Ferrari driver that's staying, Charles Leclerc, uh, he must be just scratching his head because it's strategy, it's race pace. I mean, he had to let his teammate go past. You couldn't have stopped him anyway, which was a good call from Ferrari. Qualifying was Charles's weakness. Huh? He's never he's never weak in qualifying. That's he's arguably the fastest man over one lap on the grid, and but he is apparently struggling to get his tires into the operating range, and that is that just to me shows the fine line that these drivers have to to walk in order to to make their cars work. And I was trying to tell uh, you know my my girlfriend and my daughter when we were watching. I said there's something about when you when your tires are working this. It almost gives you a bit of a gob complex for a couple of laps because you have a, a level of grip that just makes you think you can do whatever you want with the car. And a Formula One car has to be in that window in order to, to maximize, especially for one lap. So I'm sure that, you know, using two sets of softs in just to get to Q3 compromised him. Um, but compliments to Ferrari again. He turned around a one-stop strategy and kept his race pace up. So uh, did the undercut on Lando Norris, and it worked. And he got drive, voted driver of the day. So that's uh, pretty cool. And according to my daughter, Tallulah, he's the cutest on the grid. So that has to count for something. Well, I said last week in Australia, Lando Norris had this forlorn look, you know, at finishing third. I'm sure he would have would have liked to have been third on the podium this weekend. But it's definitely proving McLaren strong ready to exploit any misfortunes of anyone ahead of them. Uh, they do have to find some pace to keep up with Ferrari, uh, but they continued, you know, their 100% scoring rate so far in 2024 and uh, still third in the championship. So I'm sure that Zach Brown, who we talk to next week uh, or two weeks time on the show, he, uh, I, I think they're going to be pretty happy with where they, where they are. The whole pattern, of course, is awash with, Fernando Alonso rumors in stark contrast to the type of rumors that are going around about Lance Stroll. Um, but I tell you, when Fernando Alonso says, that is the best I can get out of the car or the car will go no faster, I think his engineers take note and go, mm, all right, we now have to improve. And as he says, they're, they're still the fifth fastest team, which really means they should be in P9 or P10. 
They were P5 in qualifying and P6 in the race. So they maximized what they can do. And I think therein lies the brilliance of Fernando Alonso. Uh, they really did work the strategy. And, you know, that is, I wasn't really going to talk about Lance, but a lot of news circulating on, you know, is he getting his marching papers soon? I mean, his dad owns the team. He owns Aston Martin. There's so much involved in that. But you mark my words, I mean, Lance is a heck of a driver. And it doesn't matter where, if he goes into sports cars, he will be a, an amazing driver. And the way I look at it is even in Formula One, to be at the top, to drive at this level, it doesn't matter if your dad's a billionaire, what got you in the seat? You're in the top 1% of drivers. The trouble is to be a Max Verstappen, a Charles, a Carlos, Sergio, you have to be in the top 0.1%. And he's not. Uh, but it doesn't mean he wouldn't have a good career elsewhere. Um, I was intrigued by the Mercedes, weren't you? I, I thought it was it was an interesting weekend for them. I thought the, you know, um, Lewis Hamilton call, sorry, when he said, asked the question to his engineer, shall I let George buy, just showed a resignation and a realization of the reality of, of what they're doing. And, you know, to swap positions with your teammate a bit like Claire did with science. It's the only thing to do. George was faster at the time. And I don't, right now, George doesn't need to be, I mean, Lewis doesn't need to be threatened by George, but I did enjoy watching the way they, uh, you know, the different sort of attitudes, the way they go racing. George is obviously staying. He's the future of Mercedes. Lewis has got that lucrative Ferrari contract. And for me, it's just a realistic sign of where they are at the moment, the car seems to, I mean, what did George say? He said, my helmet's almost flying off. It's bouncing so much down the straight. Tough, tough ergonomic issues for the driver, which are obviously a reflection of tough, tough aerodynamic issues to solve on, out on the car. But they'll do it. I, I know that they will get there. Um, and, you know, a little bit similar for Oscar Piastri, who finished eighth. And is, is it a lack of experience that's meaning he just isn't quite getting the results of Lando? Probably. He is a fast learner. He's got an amazing attitude, um, but he got points. So I don't really have much more to say about uh, Oscar. I'm sure, believe me, he will, he'll be on the podium himself very soon. But back to Lewis. Lewis finished ninth. It, it was a really rough race pace for them. And in the temperature, it was about 14 degrees hotter on race day than they'd driven before. And it seems that the Mercedes is incredibly susceptible and vulnerable to changes in the temperature. And you might think, well, how does that work? And what does that do? Well, it really does affect the operating window of these tires. And it can do so much for the rest of us that drive on the road and you just put your Michelin's on or Pirelli's on or whatever, you, you drive on it, you don't think about it. But as I just said, the level of grip you get from the perfectly operating tires and the way that affects the chassis, the, the roll center, the dynamics, everything is so great. Uh, it's a huge effect. So they were just eating up the tires in the first half of the race. And then the minute it got a little cloudy, they go faster. So that, you know, that's a lot of head scratching. And I can, you can just feel for Lewis because, you know, his head's down doing the best job he can. He must be looking at the red cars going, yippee, I can't wait for that next year. Uh, but at what point... And I'm sure he asked himself this, does that divergence start to happen when they can no longer share with him the full development of the cars for, for next year and stuff? So I don't know. Um, we're going we're gonna to have to see. Uh, but I tell you what, he, he's eating some humble pie that after the pit stops, Lando, Norris and, and Perez, their overtake on him was brutal and masterful. And the onboards of how close, when they replayed it, how close they were going through the chicane, uh, you know, with the rear tires between him and Carlos. I know they're aware of it, but just watching, even as a former driver, it just makes you wince, doesn't it? You're like, how on earth are they not touching? Uh, but it did result in Lewis making a very uh, aggressive call, like to his to his engineer. He said, let's just change this strategy, please, like now. Um, because Lewis, he doesn't race just to get points. But we'll see them back up there. I, mean, I really think so in China. We're going to see some improvements for them. But we'll round this out in 10th place with Yuki Tsunoda, who just, the boy came alive. I mean, what a weekend for the homeboy. Fast from the go, 
the fans were absolutely apoplectic with excitement to, to see him there and, uh, and see him doing well. And it must feel good getting his first points uh, at home this year. And <laughs> someone outside the window just uh, trying to give me uh, their feelings on the Grand Prix at the weekend. Um, I mean, Yuki's driving out of his skin. And it was an interesting interesting thing because, yes, he his outpacing of Daniel Ricciardo is probably a big problem for Daniel, not for, for Yuki. But the issue for Yuki is he's driving his best and absolutely deserves his place in the team. But he's not going to be in contention for the top Red Bull seat. I just can't see that happening. Remember what I said about the top 1%, the top 0.1%, uh, 0.1%. That's where he lies in the, in the latter. Um, and I'm sure if they're going to keep him with the, you know, Visa Cash App RB Racing because he's doing so well and it's obviously always economically good to have a great uh, young Japanese driver in the field. And everybody, I, I, watching on TV, I had tingles watching it, but um, what it must have been like for the Japanese fans there, I bet he could even hear them roar through his helmet uh, because he kept on overtaking people. Hulkenberg... Uh, I can't even remember who else, but he did two or three of them through the on the outside going through the S's. And I'll tell you what, going through those corners, you're kind of holding on to the wheel. And I just thought it was masterful what he actually did. He is definitely, this weekend, he's a small man, but with big hands. Um, all right, what's... So, listen, we are getting to this point right now that as I look at the way uh, the weekend unfolded, uh, I guess a little credit to Logan Sargent. Uh, yeah, he had a wreck at the beginning. Um, ran as high as 13th, uh, finished 17th. But, you know, he does need a glimmer of hope because for Williams, it is a disaster zone. Three crashes in two weeks. The budget cap, they're about to blow that apart. But it's not just the money, it's the pressure to make the spares, the upgrades. Will they be ready with the second car for China? For China? As I said, uh, team manager James Fowles has got a ton on his Face, so to deal with. Um, well, how fun has was that race? I, I definitely enjoyed it. And well, guys, I can't believe I'm already saying this, but the Las Vegas Concord is back for 2024, one of the world's most prestigious automotive events taking place November 1st through the 3rd at the Wynn Golf Club, right here at the Wynn Las Vegas. It's a one-of-a-kind immersive experience. The Las Vegas Concours is an exhibition featuring more than 250 distinctive automobiles from around the world, paying homage to remarkable cars of the past, present, and future. It's a celebration of heritage, craftsmanship, and innovation. The Las Vegas Concours at Win Las Vegas brings car enthusiasts from all corners of the globe to revel in automotive excellence, all against the dynamic backdrop of the Las Vegas Strip. And who will you find emceeing and hosting this event? On stage, doling out all that heavy hardware to the very prestigious winners? Well, of course, it's me. And so definitely come and say hi this November. For more information regarding recently added rooms and packages, you can visit lasvegasconcor.com. That's lasvegasconcor.com. Let me introduce my guest uh, coming up in just a couple of seconds. Dale and Hart Jr., uh, no real introduction needed, but he is a 26 times winner in the NASCAR Cup Series, two times Xfinity Series champion, two times Daytona 500 winner, and now equally well known for his very laid back and cool broadcasting style and his hugely popular Dirty Mo Media podcast. Dale, it's good to have you on the show, mate. Yeah, yeah, I'm thankful to be on the show. Uh, lucky to run into you. A couple of weeks ago yeah. uh, in Florida, and glad you asked me to come on, man. This is awesome. I was just telling you the set looks incredible. Um, I'm kind of jealous. Uh, I could use a couple of days in Vegas. It sounds yeah. like fun. We need to do it. Do it. Come over to the Grand Prix. You know, I know you haven't been to one, so you should come and do it. Um, yeah, that was great. That was really good, wasn't it? At Amelia Island, seeing Rick Hendrick get honored like that. I, I, I I mean, obviously, you're so involved, you know, involved in the sport, and you you understand him better than I do. But for me, just as someone that only knows him socially, he just seems like one of those good guys. Rick is a uh, <clears throat> Rick is a good guy. He he has this charm about him. When you're an employee of his, he has a magic, and you 
want to make this guy happy. You want to do everything you can to get a pat on the back or get acknowledged by him in any way. And he, he has that effect on everybody that comes to work for him. So you imagine, you know, 450, 550 employees at his race teams at Hendrick Motorsports. And then he has the, you know, dozens and dozens of car dealerships all across the country with hundreds and thousands of employees uh, helping those dealerships function on a daily basis. And he is, you know, he is in connection. He's in, he's in close contact with all of these employees at some point throughout the year. And he makes this, even in moments where you're, it's brief, he makes you feel like he truly is thankful that you're there, that you're a part of the team. He makes you feel like part of the team. He makes you feel important, like an asset, like you're needed, you're, mm. ne- you're necessary. It's a hell of a quality. Um, and I think it's just a, you know, it's just a personality trait that really serves him well as a, as a leader. Yeah, I, it just really is. I know obviously never raised for him, and he he invites me every year to try and go and do. You know, when he takes the cars out and goes to the track, and yeah. that's how I'm like, oh, I got to make it one day. Uh, but the other thing, you know, it was mind blowing. Employees that work there twenty years, he gets them a Rolex. I mean, there's a lot of bosses yeah. that wouldn't have to do that. That's wild, you know. I know he has a lot of. There's a lot of things that they do similar to that, whether it's the Rolex or what have you, um, anytime there's a milestone for the company, uh, whether it's wins, 200, 300, 400 wins, or the engine shop does something and achieves a milestone, everyone is celebrated and everyone's giving something physical to remember that by. And I think about that from time to time. All of that adds up, Um, but it's important, you know, and and he knows that, and he knows that being able to take something tangible home to acknowledge a moment in your career that was part of a bigger moment for the organization, uh, that that really means a lot to the employees, and it keeps everybody focused and working hard. It's definitely something to be learned there, right, man? I mean, it's uh, it's amazing. And that's yeah. really, I know you're not a massive Formula One fan, and this kind of is a show many about Formula One, but I, I thought the interesting thing for us to like touch upon is it doesn't really matter whether you're in NASCAR, IMSA, sports cars, Le Mans racing, um, or or in Formula One, I think there's so many areas of commonality that, okay, it's a bit like squash and tennis, right? It's, I mean, like soccer and football, but the, intri- you know, the essentials are the same. Um, and when you, you think about how involved you are in the world of NASCAR, how involved I was in sports cars, now I'm really enjoying, you know, following Formula One. There's definitely those similarities, and, and for you, if you look across different forms of motorsport, what are the what are the key things you're, that that unite our sports? Well, I think that um, you know there are there there are years where Formula One for me is in incredibly entertaining, and um, um, back when Schumacher uh, and 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 those guys were going at it, Mika, um, it was there were some years where you get in credit, you know, really plugged in. And, um, and, um, I'm a big fan of Max. I like to see Max succeed. I love to see him dominate. Um, and so I have, I have some interest rooting interest in, mm-hmm. in F1. It's tough to see all of the races due to the schedule, but, um, and being on the East coast, but, um, I, you know, I feel like that, uh, you stay tuned in, you stay kind of, you keep your, you keep your ear to the ground to, to, if you're, you know, for me in NASCAR, I, 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 I try to stay current on what's happening in F1 when it comes to economics, mm. uh, race team economics, series economics, um, when it comes to um, what are their challenges to trying to create an entertaining product. NASCAR is sort of going through this same process right now with a new car where the car is exceptional in some areas and in other areas, it's very frustrating because it doesn't put on a great product. And I know that F1 is always aware of trying to make sure that, that they don't fall into a rut, you know, and, and um, giving the teams the ability to create um, and be able to set themselves apart. Uh, and also, you know, it drives a lot of uh, excitement around certain manufacturers and certain teams and so forth. And so we, 
we are competitive. I say we NASCAR is competitive towards other forms of motorsport, but we also pay attention to what they're doing right and what we think we can learn from it. And so that's probably why I might pay attention to F1 or sports car today or IndyCar is to try to see what I can learn, what NASCAR could learn or apply uh, to be better. Uh, because we do, rather, the cars are different. Um, the the approach may look different, but we all fight the same thing economically with engine and supply and parts. And where do we want to go? Where are we going to be in five or 10 years as an industry? We all are going to face the same obstacles and challenges. And some have already faced them and overcome them, right? And what are those lessons to be learned? So I, you know, <clears throat> I want NASCAR to, to be successful. I want it to 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 win and be appreciated and so as we do face obstacles what can we see from other other forms of motorsports and what can we learn from that and it's a really good answer because if you think it the money's doesn't matter the level of money uh it's the pressure teamwork you got the sponsors you got the media i mean everybody is is it's the same ingredients they're just different ingredients right and yeah. You you look at it, I mean, so, so long NASCAR was the golden goose and it just kept on laying very big, fat golden eggs, right? And then, you know, through the IMSA side of things, IMSA's, I'm saying this to the audience, you know, being owned by by the France family, you know, we've definitely had some uh, oversight from them in more ways than one. And it gives you a little insight into what they do. But they, they spent a lot of time scratching their head knowing it's, you know, this multi-billion dollar in, industry, one wrong rule change and you're going to alienate the the viewers and without the people in the stands without the tv audience there's no there's no way to to continue to grow and certainly domestically you guys are, are massive but now formula 1 have got the a suddenly massive in the states right three races here dell it's kind of wild um and Yet they're talking about these engine rules for 2026 that could literally totally grenade us, the Formula One sport. Uh, uh, you know, from from a visual side of things, um, those are, I imagine the things you guys have to think about as well. Because technology is really cool, but it's also really expensive. And uh, my dad used to say a lot, or still does, it doesn't always mean you get a better product just because you make it more complicated. And that is that one of the things NASCAR has to always keep an eye on. Yeah, I feel like that sometimes, um, to your point, technology is cool, and you get you get a, you get distracted by the shiny new thing, or you know we may we you know we we may believe here in in the states that um, the the future. So NASCAR, no different than any other form of motorsport, really relies on manufacturer support. So. For our main, you know, we need to be an asset to a Chevrolet, to a Toyota, to a Ford. We need to be an asset to them. We need them to care and want to be involved in our sport. So we need to help them be successful selling cars to everyday Americans, right? And so we have to stay in lockstep with what they want to produce in mass quantities and sell to the public. We have to be relatable to that so the public can look at us and and see what we're putting out on the racetrack and see some similarities, right? And 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 if a Chevrolet goes and dominates, might encourage somebody to consider that being the next car they purchase. Um, so that's been the long that's been sort of the the nucleus of our of our of our existence for forever is that manufacturer support. And um, you know, there are times when you're wondering whether this, you know, is it EV and, and, and electric cars? Is that the future? Is Do we need to get moving in that direction now so that we're, again, in lockstep with what is being produced for the public? And then there will be moments where you feel like that we're maybe too too quick to move in that direction. Maybe we need to be, be patient and allow that to play out a little longer. Is that, you know, we have the ability and the, and, the, and we can definitely make the effort to move in that direction, but maybe that's not where we need to go. And uh, we've heard some of the drivers or some of the car owners even come out recently and talk about how maybe we need to slow down our, our, our um, excitement around moving in that direction. Um, so you just have, like you to your point, you don't want to make the wrong move. You don't want to do something that fans may find unappealing. Um, 
you know, and we wondered about going to a single lug. Fans wanted to hear those five lugs on each wheel during a pit stop, all of that noise and that, Mm -hmm. you know, that excitement. They thought that was really going to change what a pit stop looked like. And we've learned that it really hasn't. It's actually made the pit stops even more interesting and more of a, of a bigger moment for the teams uh, because they have to happen so quickly. And um, so there's some things that, you know, fans are concerned about in, in terms of, you know, whether it be moving to electric vehicles or any kind of, you know, hybrid losing the sound of that combustion engine and thing, you know, that they love so much. Um, NASCAR has to be careful, right. On making sure that they, they certainly don't, don't turn people off. It's so much easier to do. It seems like these days than maybe, you know, 30, 40 years ago, you could make a misstep and, and sort of regroup and bring things back together. But it doesn't seem like you have that same grace anymore. Um, and and the audience is or, all connected. I mean, now <laughs> the voices through social media are connected, right? It becomes a shout yes. straight away. It's not. Oh, it's yeah. not the outliers. There, it's noisy. <laughs> I, I mean, you you. My racing career was so modest, but you know, you with the family name. I mean, you were one of those one of those superstars, mate. And yet, you were also just on the cusp of the social media thing when you were behind the wheel. Now, obviously, as a broadcaster and stuff. Um, I know you're, you're very much, you know, still high, you know, highly, highly present on social media, but the demands on a modern day driver in Formula One and the like, uh, do you relate to that? The crazy, the crazy pressure they get, uh, you know, the way they're under the microscope? Yeah. Um, yeah, I certainly can, can relate to that. I felt like that that was, um, you know, during my career, I felt like I was certainly, whether I ran really well or was running really bad, I felt like that I was always um, in the spotlight, you know, and that was fine. I, 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 um, I was definitely happy about that. That was not a bad thing. Um, but I think when you're talking about demands on the drivers, um, I was, I was in a very unique situation. I could, I could say things, and be a little more honest and a little more transparent and even a little more brash than most drivers. And I could get away with it. And that I, I got, obviously my last name helped a lot to, I guess I was given a lot of grace mm-hmm. by fans and media and so forth throughout my career because of my, my father's legacy. But I had sort of, I have sold myself as this sort of wild man that likes to party and have fun and then goes in races and, and very, you know, sort of, sort of a, I wouldn't say a class clown, but maybe just free, free of, spirit, kind of a free spirit. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Perfect analogy. How was me? And so I would be, I had friends that I raced with that had sponsors that really did not like any kind of, publicity unless it was about their product or about their results on the racetrack where I was sponsored for a lot of my career by Budweiser and man, the more media and press I could get, no matter what I was doing, that was good. They liked that. And, um, if I was talking about drinking beer with my friends on the, during the week that they loved that I was selling their product, but other friends of mine that had other more conservative, uh, partners weren't able to get away with that. Right. And so, I've never really known what's that, what that's like to have to sort of live in a box and be very cautious and careful about what I shared and how I, how I spoke or what viewpoints I presented. So um, I think it's tough these days. We've seen um, people make mistakes and we've seen the results of those mistakes. And I think that makes the drivers even more guarded and, and, and reserved. And, um, and, you know, I, I feel like that there's a lot more responsibility during the week. I was just thinking about this the other day with Chase Elliott. Um, when I was driving full time, the 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 hours that you put in in preparation during the week, I felt like they were a lot. Um, but compared to what the drivers do today, their work week, their traditional work week. Um, they're in meetings Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They're in the simulator for hours during the week. 
Um, and they're in multiple meetings, right, throughout the week, talking about the last race, reviewing the, the, the coming race, talking about strategies, or, or what all the variables that could come into play and all the strategies that could be presented and tried. And we, we didn't, we had one meeting. We had a one competition meeting that lasted about an hour. We reviewed the last race. We talked about the next one. Then I'd sit down with my crew chief. Hey, man, you good? Yeah, I'm good. All right. I'll see you this weekend. Um, it's incredible. If you want to be great, how much time you have to put into it. There's time, there's room for nothing, nothing else. There's room for no hobbies and no other distractions. If you want to be able to compete with William Byron and, and Kyle Larson and, and those guys. What would your dad have made of all this? I mean, my dad's caught, you know, yeah. my dad's obviously a, a spectator. <laughs> my dad remembers, you. he did the IROC with, with Dale, you know, and he was yes. like, he was like, I thought I was doing well. And I kind of, he said he touched your dad and then your dad just moved him all over the bank. You know what I mean? He just did whatever he wanted. My yeah. dad was like, I'm a world champion. I haven't even got a clue what's happening in the car. But he said, you know, your dad was notorious for being tough, but straightforward. What would he have made of all yeah. the, the kind of, bull that the drivers have to do now or what it takes yeah i don't know i i um i remember when the first racing simulator came out on on pc back in the early 90s they had some some early racing games on on pc and i i had my sister buy a 400 hundred dollar computer and put it on her credit because i didn't have any credit <laughs> and so um, and dad's like, those computers are a waste of time. Who are you wasting your time with that? Computers are a waste of time. Nobody, you know, he, he was, and I mean, literally like year, just a couple years later, we're starting to see engineers with laptops starting to show up at the racetrack and be present and part of race teams. And now, you know, these days, it's, you know, everything's engineer and, and simulator driven. And even now, multi, you know, manufacturers are building simulators, big, giant video games, literally, that yeah. we go play for real life, right, to prepare for the race. And so F1 was way ahead on that. Um, but I, I, I laugh at that because I, I would love to stand here and say, hey, how about these, these video games? But yeah. that's like <laughs> literally how we prepare for the race weekend these days without any practice. Um, I don't know what he would have thought of social media. He'd have probably hated it, never had nothing to do with that. But the, he would get home, you know, he would, he was very good at, he spent a ton of time during the week as a businessman. Um, and he, you know, managing the race team, his own race team, what his responsibilities were with uh, Richard Childress racing and his own Dillon Hart Incorporated race team. And then when he needed to, to get his mind right or, or go work out, he jumped on a tractor, he jumped on a bulldozer, he went out and stacked hay bailed hay, worked on the farm, did hard manual labor. That was the way that he broke away and, and got reset mentally every week and uh, stayed in shape that way, you know. And <clears throat> I don't know how he did it because, uh, well, I mean, I kind of got into riding bikes with Jimmy a little bit on the last uh, the last season of my, my career. I uh, rode about 2,400 miles. I'd never rode bikes before in my life and ended up getting into it with Jimmy. rode 2,400 miles in 2017. So it's kind of the same thing. He, he, he had something that he could use to clear his mind, and it was important to him to be able to have those moments to do that during the week. But I don't know that he would have really got into all of the meeting, the sitting down and looking at a big whiteboard and um, reviewing last week's race and what he could have done better on pit road. He would have been – hard to criticize right who tells Dale Earnhardt Sr. that they were you know they lost the car they lost the spot on pit road because they didn't yeah. exit the box properly <laughs> yeah he didn't hit his marks I bet, I bet he'd be, yeah right he, I don't want to be the guy that would have told you that, that <laughs> jeez no um you know I thought of you on uh Sunday just because I was when in the race well thank first thanks for sharing that about your dad that's really cool um they had a red flag right at the start on the first lap uh, two cars hit each other, uh, the Williams and the one of the RB racing cars. They went off, big crash. No one hurt, obviously, but, you know, two wrecked cars. And the next scene was all the drivers, Max, everybody back in the pit lane, helmets off. And I was trying to describe to my, to my girlfriend and, and my daughter what it's like to get out of a car and do that. And I've obviously had it a few times, as have you. 
Can you share what it was like for you to, you know, that what it's like as a driver, you're wound up for the start, all that adrenaline, all that preparation, helmet on, it all goes quiet. Then there's a wreck and you're in a red, you know, you're back out of your helmet with a race to go. Uh, that's very tough. What was that like for you? Any experiences like that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, um, you know, if you were, if you were training all month for a hundred meter race, right. And you're, you're staged at the starting line and you're thinking about getting the best start possible. Um, they fire the gun and you lurch forward and, and then they, then they call the start off, right. You have to reset. Um, I, I always felt like though, to be quite honest with you, that those moments gave me an advantage. Anytime there was a time that we had to, uh, we had to get out of the car and unplug from that adrenaline and, and we had to go sit on a pit box or if there was going to be any kind of a wait, if there was a rain delay, whether it was an hour or six hours or the next day, I always thought that, man, I'm going to, I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay motivated and, and I'm going to stay hungry and somebody's not some Somebody's going to forget how important this race is. Somebody's going to lose that drive and that motivation and, and that fire. Mm. And I always thought, man, rain delays were going to help me, right? Rain delays were, I was going to stay, you know, in the moment while someone else might lull themselves out of that, you know, and, and get caught sort of too relaxed and too down. And when the race restarted, they wouldn't be able to really summon mm. the, the uh determination and, and risk taking necessary that um that I felt like I could do, you know. So it was any time a race got pushed late, like ten o'clock, late at night or something like that, I'm like, none of these guys want to be here. That was what I'm thinking in my mind, right? Even if it was true or not. I'm like, they don't want to be here. I want to be here. This is perfect for me. I stay up late. I'm a, I'm I stay up all night long. How late you want to race? You know, and none of these other guys want to do this. They all want to go home. You know, that was what I'm thinking in my mind. So when I get out on the track, I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm in a better position mentally and emotionally than the rest of them. I don't know if it was real or unreal, you know, or I was just making it up, but it was helpful, you know. That's a great um, story. That's really, yeah. you know, it's, it's, that's funny, Del. For, for me, I did something, um, I was never the world's best qualifier, but we did standing starts, right? In a lot of my yeah. uh, formative years, I would always go onto the grid. Imagine I'm sixth and I'd be like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be second into the first corner. I, I just, it made me have the best starts, made standing yeah. starts, maybe because I was so crap at qualifying, but I just had this inner belief that I had really quick reaction times, totally unfounded. But guess what? I actually had some really good starts. I became known as a really good, you know, off the line. So I think it is that we have to position ourselves as athletes, right? In whatever sport yes, to find that. Thing. Um, so that, yeah. yeah, really cool. Uh, on that I, note, I, sorry, Carol. No, well, I was just going to say, you know, I'm always, I always admired. Um, well, I mentioned Chase Elliott a couple, couple minutes ago. We interviewed him before uh, he won the championship at Phoenix, and he said something like, "You know, I'm, I'm going to." He, 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 he envisioned winning this title, and I always admired the athlete, whether it's in racing or anything that can see winning and go out there and, and make it and materialize it. Right. The law of attraction is what my wife calls it. If you believe it en enough, mm -hmm. you, it will happen. And I've always admired drivers and, and athletes that can see themselves succeeding. And then they go out there and it happens. And I don't know, I've never was that way. I mean, I just, that wasn't part of my personality. I would start the race wondering whether I was going to win, not, not thinking I was going to win it. Um, now, you know, as the race plays out, I start to see the, 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 the light at the end of the tunnel or the possibility come, come around that I might have a shot at it. But some people were so confident, right. That they, they just go, I'm going out here. This, this is my race. I'm going to win this race. I see it. And they, they the know. Future. They have this this self belief. It's interesting. I mean, we we can have this conversation over a beer, I guess, one day. But uh, in a sort of being candid, I, I I've asked. You know, I have this other little podcast I did called Life with Legends. Just me. It's a passion project, talking to Mario and Jackie Stewart and my dad and everyone. 
But I'd ask a question of them. Who was it in the driver's briefing, you know, back in the day? Who did you look at and go, geez, they're here. You know, they, <laughs> yeah. damn. Right. I've got to beat Jim Clark. I've got to beat Fittipaldi. You know, whatever it is. And it's a really interesting question because Mario just answered it with, not not really anyone. <laughs> you know what I mean? He just was so supremely confident. And But it was yeah. a common denominator. Those guys knew they were the best on the day. And that's, I can't actually say I ever really thought that. But like you, I could see it unfold in the race. And that's where I, yes. you know, I think that's another way of doing it. Let's talk domination for a minute. Your dad dominated, right? We've seen Jimmy dominate in, in NASA. We've seen Jeff Gordon dominate. You you know, you at the 500 was so strong um, and two championships. But Max Verstappen, this dominating like that, as you said, you're a Max fan. Last year when was, everyone was getting a little bored of him winning and I'm like, we've got to celebrate this moment. This is something we may yeah. never see again. What, what, what are your feelings on domination in any form of sport? But especially watching Max do what he's doing. Yeah, I, I like it. I, I, um, I know that, you know, so there, I, I look back on examples of that in my own life. Um, there was a period of time in the early eighties where Daryl Walter won a lot of races and he was booed quite a bit because it just seemed like he was going to have a shot or, 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 or win every other race. And I think that, you know, there was times where maybe Jimmy's light didn't shine as bright as it should have, knowing who, who he was as a person and how cool of a guy he is. Fans just did not embrace this guy winning five championships in a row and ultimately seven titles. And um, But it's on the same token, they, you know, they loved seeing Dad do it. Yeah, six um, out of nine championships, right? Your dad was six he, out of yeah. nine? I mean, well, yeah, it was, you know, I think that if a guy goes out and we have had this happen, uh, Martin Trix Jr. won a race at Kentucky by like 13 seconds one night and everybody just thought that the sky was falling. And I'm thinking, why don't we think this is amazing? This, this team went out and set themselves so far apart from anyone else. Why aren't we amazed and just in awe? of what, is, what he accomplished tonight. But instead, we thought, oh, man, this is the worst. Gosh, I hope this never happens again. And I thought, you know, that wasn't the case 30, 40, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Somebody went out and did something truly unique and was uh, quite a bit better than the rest of the competitors. You, We, we, we celebrated that for decades. Mm. Um, that 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 made that person an, an icon and, and somebody that will remember forever. Um, and so I think it should. It, it it's not always going to be that way. And when it does happen, either you know whether it's you know whether who deserves whoever deserves the credit, Max, the cars, the developers, all that should be celebrated. And um, you know certainly it won't last forever. No. And something will change, and another transition will happen, and. Um, you know, parody will come again, but uh, I've always thought it was great, and um, and I I kind of you know the more people grumble about it, the more I want to see it yeah. continue, I guess. But uh, because Max just kind of stares it stares them right in the eyes and grins, you know, at all of the back all of the all of the backlash around his dominance. He's so tough, man. He's so tough. He, he was raised tough. He's just, I mean, literally, I mean, he it's the car. Plus Max, right? But then we're looking yeah. at Lewis Hamilton. Lewis has won 103 races, man. 103 pole positions. And he's, you know, having to screw around in sixth place and, you know, do all that. But remember, he had domination. Domination is part of sport. Just, he did. But it's a roller coaster. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that's the tough part for me about it. Um, what I struggle with is seeing that seeing that driver that was so dominant begin to struggle. Right. And whether it's, you know, whatever those challenges are, you want to see them get it turned around, but you know, to, to be a, to have been old, I'm, a, I, I used to always think that I was going to be young forever. And now I've reached, I'm turning 50 this year. I was old enough to see Peyton Manning come into the NFL, have his entire career arc and leave. <laughs> and I'm like, 
you know, you never want to see the greats stop being great. And um, we did that with Schumacher and um, all of the, you know, all of the ones that, that were successful throughout the years. Um, it comes to an end one day. And, uh, and, and not that that's the case for Hamilton, but someday, right. He's going to, he's going to stop racing or, or yeah. someday the success just won't be there, but it happens to everybody that I've ever known in racing, uh, in NASCAR with my, you know, even my dad sort of struggled in those final few years to be able to get those results yeah. that he was so used to getting. And, um, seeing, I, I, when I started thinking about my own retirement, you know, I went to drivers and I said, what is it that, what tells you this is when you need to stop, you know? Um, and it's a hard, hard one. thing to figure out. We, yeah. yeah, I, I, not to ramble, but I quit full-time racing and I just talked to another driver about this that retired this past year. And he said, man, I'm so glad I don't have to be at the track every week. I love not having to go. I go when I want. And uh, I said, yeah, I felt like that the first year, too. And then every year after that, I started missing it more and more. I thought the further I got away from it, the more it would, you know, I would I would just be able to let go. But it's actually the opposite for me. Maybe it's not yeah. the same for everybody, but the, gra the gravitational more more pull as time goes by. Yeah, the gravitational yeah. pull, man. And we see more about it. Well, I mean, just so many things I, I was going to ask you about. Garage 56, I bet you wish you could have driven that at Le Mans. I mean, just so much, man. And we and I, I left Corbett. I got asked. Yeah, you did get asked. Whoa. Yeah, Jack and Al asked me if I'd be interested, even I think maybe just to help with them to get the car yeah. tested and get it going through. But got I was it. like, man, I'm, I'm not the, I'm not the, I'm definitely not the road course expert you need in that car, but I'm glad they got Jimmy and those guys yeah. together. Also, Dale, I don't want to have to stay that fit anymore i gotta tell you i'd do an hour race any day right a couple of hours but i don't think about 24 yeah well listen it's time now for a little segment we do called mobile one pit stop just a few questions i'm going to ask you just for some fun um what is your yep. favorite car you ever owned my favorite car that i've ever owned is probably a 1976 chevy laguna um, this car raced in the NASCAR series and Kelly Yarborough won a couple championships with this car, but it was outlawed because of the aerodynamic advantage it presented on the nose of the car. And I love the seventies and everything about cars, character lines, clothes, style. I, if I could take myself and put myself in any error in NASCAR, I think the mid seventies, like 74, 75, 76 would be a cool time to be be around the garage and seeing how things were done. I love that answer, which probably means your favorite song would be from the 70s. My favorite song is um, actually uh, Rose Colored Glasses, which is from the early 80s. John Conley sings okay. that. It's a country song, but it's a very, it's a really, really good ballad. This guy's singing from his heart. And uh, I remember being a child growing up in my mother and uh, my mom's house and around my grandparents and all that. And they played a lot of old, you know, it was old, it's old country now, but they played a lot of country music. And so all of that early eighties, late seventies country music kind of always gets me. Out of all the NASCAR drivers, actually from any era, uh, who do you think could have cut it if given a shot at Formula One? Probably... Man, I'm going to probably say Jeff Gordon. Um, even, uh, I mean, even over uh, Jimmy Johnson in his prime, there was something. I, there was something about Jeff that was that was global. Um, he had the ability to bust out of our bubble and do other things and do them well. And I think him in his prime, if he had went that route that he could have made that successful. Uh, he just had, he had the ability, uh, I think, you know, not just in the car, but out of the car to maybe fit in that world better than most. Um, and the, and the, I think the travel and the, the glitz and glad that would have been right up his alley. He would have loved that. That's a great answer. And the right size in his day. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it looks a little more portly, <laughs> portly when I saw him the other day, right? The, the, the suit yeah, isn't quite he's, as he's slim. Trying to work on it. 
<laughs> um, well, listen, Mobile One is all about the love of driving and everybody has a memory that reminds them of that. What was yours? What was the moment you first put your hands on a wheel? I'm sure it was very young, but you went, Ashy, this is my life. This is what I want to do. Well, um, probably, it probably happened um, before I actually drove. My dad took me to a racetrack in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and probably around 1985 or 6, and I was about 11 or 12 years old, and he was testing this this car at a very short half mile racetrack um coincidentally i'd end up racing there in the 90s cutting my teeth and racing but um it's in myrtle beach south carolina four hours from where i am right now where i grew up we went down there and i was just glad to go i begged dad every time he left the house to take me with him wherever he was going i wanted to be with dad all the time and um so finally he takes me to this test and he's like hey i'm gonna go out and work the brakes in you want to ride with me and so i climbed in the pasture side of that race car and he goes out on the racetrack and he's like in second or third gear going very, you know, re, you know, under 50 miles an hour. But he really, really uh, revved the car up and launched forward and then slam on the brakes. And he kept doing this over and over and over. And I'm, I'm sitting on the car cover in the floorboard on the passenger side, sliding around, trying to hang on to the roll bars as he's getting the brakes on this car worked in brand new brakes. And he wanted to bend them really good. And so just riding in that car around that racetrack with my dad was the moment where I was like, I'm looking over at him and I'm like, I got to be that one day. I want to do that. I want to be him. I want to be like him. And uh, so that was the moment I think when, when I decided that nothing else mattered, right. It was, there was nothing else that was going to matter. All that, all that I wanted to do was drive. Dale, thank you so much, mate. This was really, it was uh, an honor. I was really looking forward to it. I know we could talk for hours, but uh, well, hopefully yeah. if maybe come to the Formula One here. I, I actually was talking to Rick. I'd love to go to a, I haven't been to a NASCAR race in decades. So I'm going to try and make it uh, this year to one of them. So hopefully we can connect I would then. love to come out there. Yeah, I'd love to come to an F1 race. I've never been. Daniel Ricciardo has been friendly with me uh, because of his appreciation for my dad. And I thought maybe that would be a connection for me to get to a race eventually at some mm. point, but I'd love to go. Never been. I'm sure I'd, you know, it'd be an, you know, a, a life, uh, once in a lifetime experience similar to what going to the Indy 500 was like for me. Um, and I'm thankful we ran into each other and I'm, yeah. I'm glad you asked me to come on the show. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, race fans, Justin Bell here. So what is it about a race that's so exciting? The breakneck speeds, the constant pressure, that ever-present threat of danger, or is it simply the driving? Think about it. There's no phones, no laptops, no screens, just the world's greatest drivers, cars, and the ultimate freedom. Yep, for me and most of us, it's all of the above. Mobile One for the love of driving. Visit loveofdriving.us slash drive to win to learn more. Well, I mean, I was a bit starstruck there. I mean, that is Dale Earnhardt Jr. It was very cool. How lucky were we to get to talk to him and obviously his knowledge about racing and stuff it's it's crosses all languages really so uh, we're all one family just different voices well the next race is in shanghai china it's first time we go back there since 2019 uh, the weather is supposed to be cold colder than we saw in japan which is obviously going to be good for the mercedes as i talked about a bit earlier graining on the tires is going to be a big factor and that's where we might see a bit of an equalizer. The Red Bulls will suffer a bit in the cooler temperatures and the Ferraris will go forward. So I'm very intrigued. Uh, I will say it on my little Podium Plus picks in, in next week, but I actually think that you're going to see, I reckon we could see Leclerc on, on pole there. But there's not a lot of data on the track uh, in the latest Formula One cars, so that's going to level the feel a bit puts a lot of pressure on, especially as it's a sprint race format, which means you basically have about half the amount of test time, track time. So everybody has to be on their game, puts a lot of pressure on the team, such as Williams, who are literally got both chassis going back to uh, the UK to be repaired. And you might say, why don't they have a ton of spares <sighs> with that amount of money? I, I think it's a logistical thing. And if you've watched Drive to Survive, you can see it takes them about a day to make one 
one bolt. So no wonder Formula One takes a lot of time. Um, spare a thought for what everyone's going to be doing. Obviously, Red Bull are just going to be doubling down on how good they are right now. I mentioned, uh, obviously, Williams. Uh, it's also this crazy time for the drivers. I think we got 13 of the drivers up with contracts up for grabs. And when one of those dominoes falls, and I can't wait to talk to Zach Brown about this on the next episode, uh, the politics of that, the economics of that, and the consequences of one driver moving. What if Fernando Alonso says, I'm done? Boom. It's going to be like a deck of cards everywhere. But I, something tells me he won't do that. Well, that's a wrap here from the Win Las Vegas. A big thanks to everyone in this beautiful building for all their support. And of course, to Mobile One, for the love of driving. Remember, follow along on social media, on Instagram at drive to win and absolutely share our podcast wide and far. It'll really help us continue to grow and attract even bigger guests. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Take care.